and welcome back to the Bottomless Podcast. That is season two, Bottomless, B-T-T-M-L-E-S-S podcast, episode six. And would you look at, oh no, seven, right? <laughs> episode seven, <laughs> uh, me misspeaking, look at me. Anyway, <laughs> um, episode seven of the Bottomless Podcast. Uh, let's get right into introductions. My name is Kevin. Uh, and we have a special guest today, but before we get to the special guest's introduction, let's do the other introductions. I'm Kevin, and then the other two hosts are... I'm Leslie. And I'm Vincent. I swear to God. And <laughs> we are the three original for the Bottomless Podcast. And our special guest today, um, uh, before I let him introduce himself, I'll, I'll go into a little bit. He <laughs> is <laughs> some, someone that I've known, I, I want to say, for probably nine, ten years from now, eight to ten years from now, I want to say... Um, I, I was introduced to him. Someone uh, someone else was just, was giving me the the four one one about his artistry, his writing, his dancing, his acting, like all these um, all these artistic endeavors. And then I got to know him personally uh, and saw him like in terms of songwriting, singing, production, like mixing his like making an e like making bodies of music, mixing them like. And then I got to see this person's artistry, like the, all the stuff that I'd heard about the dancing, the singing, like that, all these different elements. Um, and I, I, I had never seen anyone who could dip their feet into that many different artistic avenues and hold such a high caliber within those avenues. Um, so I was immediately, and I've been always like, always appreciative of how, of how tight of a ship this person runs in terms in terms of their artistic caliber, how, um, yeah, how 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 naturally gifted this person had to be in order to be able to do this many things simultaneously to just quickly turn on a dime from singing to dancing to acting to writing to producing to animating to whatever this person was doing and to be able to just flawlessly still pull off a certain caliber that I don't even see within artists who do one avenue of artistry. Um, so I, I this is just someone who's very important to me, special to me, um, someone I, I, I admire a lot, I, I watch a lot, I have, have high expectations and hopes for in terms of their artistry in the future and what it holds. Um, and then also just someone like in terms of artists, like this person, the reason I, I appreciate about artists and endeavoring and striving to innovate, to grow, to do better, to improve, and, this, and that's probably one of my highest ideals of an artist is that they don't, they don't get stuck in a rut. They don't get stuck in um, like this, doing the same thing over and over and over. And one thing I really appreciate about this person, appreciate about this person is they constantly look for feedback, for criticism, for like input and in how to like improve their work. Um, and I just, I, I don't know this. Person. So in so many ways, but in that way in particular, I know I, I have high expectations of this person and I have high hopes and I have high beliefs for this person because they're not just insulated and thinking and hoping that they can be the one end all be all for their art. Like they're very in tune, keeping their finger on the pulse, putting content out there, like running a test try of the content and then getting the feedback and going back. And I've seen the improvement. I've seen the growth. I've seen the, so this person is someone who, who I, I believe is going to do incredible, is going to go on to do incredible things in whatever endeavor they choose, because I know they're constantly improving upon themselves and it's only gonna like exponentially increase from there but our guests go ahead and introduce yourself period i feel like i just left the gas station because i came uh, in on e and i'm on f boy <laughs> let me tell you station. okay all right um, hello thank you for that beautiful introduction um i am matthew wright and um it's a pleasure to be here Thank you all so much for having me. And I know that you guys have your microphones that you hold, and I felt left out. So uh, oh, oh, oh. tune into YouTube to see what Matt uh, did. Matt, get out. <laughs> oh, okay. And that's you that's why us. he was having 30 minute audio issues with it's your fake mic. It. It don't, it's not even on. The- I, it's a prop. It's a prop. Uh um. Yeah, Matt's Instagrams, if you want to go follow him on Instagram or on YouTube or on Twitter, at, at MW News Tonight on Instagram, M-W-N-E-W-S Tonight, T-O-N-I-G-H-T, and then also at Sitch Official, that's at S-I-T-C-H-O-F-F-I-C-I-A-L on Instagram. Uh, so give him some love, show him some love, follow him on Instagram. Um, 
Yeah, Matt, thank you for coming on the podcast. Also, the hosts of the Brown Mouthwash podcast. So far, <laughs> yes. Well, which we were a guest on, man, how long ago was that now? Like summer of 2020? Or was summer. it? No. We always assume that we've been podcasting for like seven years. <laughs> 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 we didn't even start. How long ago was that? 2006. <laughs> we haven't been Wait, podcasting since it? summer. <laughs> It was it was last year. I think it was it was later than that though. I want to say like October, November, maybe. Oh wow. So. Okay. Well, anyway, brown mouthwash is spelled brown and then M O U F wash podcast. So we'll tag all of this on our socials. For sure. For sure. Um, Matt. Okay, so I, I had a layout, but I want before I get into what I uh actually had for the next item, pl- plug a little like back background story. Where'd you grow up? Fayetteville, North Carolina, two six, and then, <laughs> and then like give us a little back, like like what was life like growing up? What's the family dynamic? What's are are you into church? Are you not into church? Like, do you have a do, are you is extended family? Is a direct family? Um, you're like, what's, profiling like, sit damn. Today. Like I know, like <laughs> let's go. Like like like. I love how you have like just a little background and then laying what? out like. <laughs> and, and I got more questions like HBCU, Pan. Like there's some there's some threads within Matt's story that I think are very important to to highlight. But yeah, go go into a little about the origin stories. Like break it down for us a little bit. Sure. When I was a young warthog, I um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. So it all started in 1997. Um, I was born oh, in Fable. <laughs> Stop. I get the chance to be the one who's actually not the youngest for us. <laughs> I ooh, I um I was born in Fayetteville and um raised in Fayetteville. Um I had both parents in the home as well as two sisters. I'm actually the middle child of my siblings. So as you can guess, I'm the most creative, but the most ignored. Um, so, <laughs> but yeah, so it was fine. I will say that we grew up um decently well off. Like we didn't really um, want for much but we also weren't like rich by any means either mm-hmm. um, I have a huge family so um, just on my mom's side it's like 12 first cousins and then <laughs> when you count the seconds and thirds and stuff we don't do that everybody cousins so every family reunion we got a handful more that we just never knew but my mom seemed to know everybody oh you know that's uncle Johnny's sister's brother's uncle's cousins nephew nieces twice what so Grew up very family oriented, um, grew up in the church. Um, I am a Christian. Uh, I started singing actually um, since I was, as far as I remember, but what it church was- What church you go most, to? Just curious. Huh? What church did you go to in Fable growing up? Um, Piney Grove Missionary Baptist Church. It was actually is, in Rayford. Also, this is the most Southern conversation ever. Uh, oh, to ask yeah, what yeah, church yeah. you went to. Wait, Pine Grove. Okay, I never been or heard of Pine Grove. Yeah, it was, it was out in Rayford where my mom's family was. So yeah. It was mostly mostly family church. So like people were born, grew up, and died in that same church. So generations, like that's that's how we grew up. So um grew up in the church around family. Um was always passionate about getting involved in those kinds of things. Um I was always a creative kid. So while my cousins were out playing football or joining sports teams, I was inside with a piece of paper learning how to draw. Um, of course, that did not make me the most popular kid, <laughs> but it might make me the most successful. Anyway, uh, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I need to stop before I get disowned. Um, see no, you need to all you your need relatives and more. <laughs> all your cousins are gonna see this and <laughs> jump you the next reunion. No, because they go, they're gonna be like, "Well, no, I'm kidding." But yeah, so <laughs> I'm joking. But yeah, so grew up around my family. We're super close, super tight. Um, I went to school at Reed Ross for middle and high school and then went to college at NC State. Um, And then that's where, okay, so I met Kevin while I was in high school, but I was hanging out with people at FSU. And then I went to NC State and started dancing there and met Vince and kind of pursued dance more primarily as a focus, but always kept music and art in my back pocket. Graduated from college, got a job in graphic design. So I'm currently a professional graphic designer and published illustrator. Come on. Come on. I saw that on your story like, what? yeah, an hour before we started. Way to pop out with a project out of like what? Yeah. <laughs> What's it's the tea on the, the publication? Yeah, it's actually um, five years old. Um, and 
not not in a flexy way, but in a way of like I low key forgot it happened. And then I came across the pictures in my Google Drive, and I was like, oh yeah, I did that. So I went to go find the book, and then I found it, and I was like, let me post about it. So yeah, awesome. but it was a children's book. It was really cute. Um, but so I did that. All that to say, um, I am I'm someone who kind of grew up as the black sheep of the family in a lot of ways, um, but found ways to stick to what I was passionate about until everybody else came around to see the value in what I was already doing. Um, so even though my story isn't necessarily the typical rags to riches type thing, um, that, that's, that doesn't invalidate some of the challenges that I've had to overcome in order to be the person with all the checks down the list that I seem to have today. And the reason Matt's story is so important to me is because, well, one of the things that like, I, I, I personally believe family and love is the greatest wealth you could have, like fuck, even even ahead of time, like family and wealth, you can have all the time in the world. If you're alone, you got no family, you got no wealth, I don't give a fuck how much time you have in your life. Um, and of course above money and of course above opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. So like, I was living in North Carolina. Every Sunday, Matt would go to his grandma house and eat after church service and eat dinner with the whole, like it'd be like 20, 30, 40 of them motherfuckers. Like, and, and so it was like some shit you would see in a movie, like shit that don't happen no more. Like shit that you have to be in the deep South to see. And so literally sometimes I would drive him out like 30, 40 minutes out of town of Fayetteville. And Fayetteville's are right, I mean, Fayetteville's more developed now, but out of Fayetteville, 30, 40 minutes to his grandma house, and he would just, I would always want to hear stories. Like, what, how many people are there? What is she, like, y'all do this every second? Damn, like, and so it was so, it was, it was so novel to me as someone who only has mom, dad, brother here in the States. And literally I've, I've, I don't have that, that, that at all. So it was always so intriguing to me. So novel. So like, and then like, it's the shit that you, I would only see dramatized about black. The one of the beauties of black culture is like this communal element of like, they, they like of sticking together, coming together around grandmama house, like grandmama cooks for everybody and grandmama's the mate. She's the matriarch of the family and like shit gets resolved there. She's the one always fixing conflict issues and resolutions. When we at grandmama house, all the bullshit stays out the door. We ain't arguing, we ain't doing all the horse shit. Like we all here for love. And so that's why, and for, so for Matt to be so artistically inclined, like he was saying graphic design, animation, singing, podcasting, drawing, dancing, acting, like very, very fashion, like fashion, like passion, like inclined within fashion and shit like that. For him to have all these nuances of artistry, but then to come from this very like rich tradition of like Matt's, you can tell Matt's raised right, how he treats women, how he acts around women, like his, he, he has home like, training. There's this, there, there is like, there is, yeah, there's this, like the way he carries himself with respect someone, the way someone treats themselves and the way someone treats other, you can tell who's around them in their family. You can tell how their parents let them act at home. You can tell like, man, did you interact a lot with women? Matt has two sisters, Matt, like Matt, it, it, so Matt has a lot of women, family members in his life that are constantly having fingerprints and influence and impact on his life and influencing how he's moving in the world. And you can see that. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I, 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 ha I have so much fascination and so much intrigue and so much awe and so much like curiosity about, about Matt's predicament. Cause it's so different from mine. It's, it's so far. It's like, it's such a far cry from what I grew up knowing. Um, so yeah, and then of course, like Matt being as young as he is, but then like when, like he's very informed about social issues and social justice issues. And when things were happening last year in June of 2020 or May or March of 2020, I was seeing responsible information through Matt's Instagram. Like Matt's connecting me to some, I, I think it was an Arabic, it might've been a black guy, I feel like it was an Arabic dude, but a brown dude in Raleigh who owns a coffee shop who's like giving very keen insight into what's happening with the protests and to not, and, and like exposing fuck shit that's happening of like fuck people who are tagging BLM to try to incite violence and riots. And Matt's like sharing just very responsible content of exposing that and showing a lot of peaceful protests and plugging you to like response, like just in so many ways, Matt's intelligent, he's gifted, he's talented, he's responsible, he's young. He like, there's just so many dynamics. He's, he's not your, a, he's not your typical youth, but then youth male, but then youth black. Like there's so many layers to who Matt is. 
and, and those demographics into which he fits into. And then when you put all those layers onto him and you com- and you put him amongst his peers and contemporaries that fit those demographics, he's such, he's so advanced for his age. He's so advanced for like this is in everything, in artistry and responsibility and maturity. He doesn't act his age. He acts so far. Be- so I, I, again, I, I know I'm, I know I'm plugging and, and, and gassing and geeking a lot, but like, I just want the audience to understand them. Like, the, like some of the mosaic that I've understood Matt to be in my time as a 28 year old, looking at someone who's younger than me, it's very rare that like, in some ways I admire so much someone who's younger than me. Um, so I kind of wanted to like, get, you know, give those roses now, like fuck waiting till like, one of us dies or something tragic happens and motherfuckers is like, so yeah, I just wanted to give Matt his roses now and let him know like he's loved, he's thought of, he's looked up to, he's admired, he's he, he, he's thought of in this world and in this life and, pe- and people have a vested interest in seeing, and, and number one, they have a vested interest in like admiring him now, but also in seeing him do well and, and prosper and succeed in life. And he, he's, he's very well like prior, he's like, he's like held, he's held very precious in the hearts of, 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 of people who, who think highly of him. Um, Thanks, Matt. Kevin. Wait, can I just say that based off the first chunk of this, the first chunk of the Jesse episode, and the first chunk of the David episode, if you want to get gassed, come on Bottomless. Period. The best place. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you have both. a precedent no, set no. when you, when you're getting gassed on. Don't say that. Half of it will be gassing. Don't say that. If we bring if we bring JoJo out here, I'm talking shit the whole time. Yeah. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> I listen. My when it, when I give it when it's due, but when it's not due, I'm gonna just rail. I'm gonna just clown your ass for 15 minutes. Um. Poor Enzo. So, so Matt, so, so what I, I guess what we wanted to talk about here, what I, what I specifically wanted to talk about here was this dynamic of artist merchant. Now, let me explain. And this is so funny because we're, we're going to go into a topic next week about something that's related to this, but for this week, for now, artist merchant. For a long time, from the beginning of time, you have artists, you have creative people, you have people who just love and out of this overflow of, of, of creativity anything, cooking, drawing, dancing, theater, fashion, rat, like writing, sculpting, like full, like, or like all these different elements. Then, you know, like at some point, some people throughout history in time figure out how to like monetize that. But for a long time, like unless you were really clever or unless you had connections and opportunity and network and, and your, maybe your parents was rich or some shit, like it, you just wasn't cutting through if you wanted to be able to make a living off your art. Like if you wanted this to be your, and then the internet comes along and the internet flattens a lot of shit. Like social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook flattens a lot of shit. It connects, it interconnects everyone. What is it like those, those like Etsy and these apps where you can shop online, uh, Alibaba, it flattens a lot of shit. I don't, you don't need to, if you wanna be a rapper or a singer, you don't need to beg Universal for 12 years to please listen to my demo tape. If you wanna publish a book, I just, Matt just pub- talked about an illustration book he just published re- uh, like five years ago, but he re-brought it up. I published a book on Amazon. You don't need the, so this idea of artist merchant has never been more possible than in our lifetime. It's never been more accessible and more cheap or more easier. But I wanna talk a little bit about that psychology of artist merchant. Cause I think people just cease influencer on Instagram, public figure on Instagram, artist on Instagram, like people just throw that shit on their title. And I, I wanted to talk about this idea of being a creative entrepreneur with you because you do it and you're still aspiring in it. You're growing in it. You're, you're actually making ground with it. And I think because Instagram today makes it seem like everybody is trying to sell something, they just think that this is like, oh, it's commonplace. Oh, if you want to be an artist or a creative or a public figure or an influencer and fucking plug your Fashion Nova code, then like we're all like this, bum ass motherfuckers. But I don't think that's normal. Like a lot of artists aren't entrepreneurial. A lot of artists aren't merchants. A lot of artists, this is not a nat- A lot of people, I know I'll say for me, it's not natural for me to try to sell myself or to sell my art. I'm the person who's like, I'm going to make art. And if you don't get it, then fuck you. But I also have this heart and this dream. So Matt, talk a little bit about the moment you went, because you've been doing art for a long time. Talk about the moment you decided you wanted to like go into merchant, like like commerce with your art. You wanted to like be able to make a living out of this, be able to like make this into something that you could like build into a business, um, into an economy. And talk about that switch. Talk about was that comfortable? Was it uncomfortable? Was it natural for you? Was it not natural? 
what what venue did you choose? I, I know what venue it is, but explain to the people, what was it singing, dancing, theater, drawing, animation? Talk about what venue that was. Like explain a little bit about that process of the moment you realized you wanted to like make this into an economy and into a commerce out of art and talk about like whether that was, because it might, I don't know. Talk about whether that was unnatural or natural, easier or not easy for you. Yeah, so uh, I guess to start, um, I kind of want to go back to what you said about how um, being an artist and being an artist entrepreneur or merchant are two different things, I think, and they're two different skill sets. I think a lot of people, especially nowadays, just feel like, oh, I can make this, so why not just put it on a shirt? And I'm like, while in practice it is literally that easy, there's so much more that goes into the field and the realm of market that people don't understand, you know, especially if you're just starting out, like if you're already a public figure and you already have a following and an audience base, then sure, I mean, put your lyrics on a shirt, people are going to buy it just because it's you. But that's the thing, they're buying you on a shirt, they're not buying the shirt. <laughs> so whenever I was thinking about selling art, um, it was actually with visual art, first before anything else and because I've been drawing since I was a little kid so people even growing up like it was as simple as like oh I like your art can I have it can I have it and I'm like do you have 50 cents <laughs> like, uh, oh, oh, but you better because because I always always thought like I was I was raised with the mentality of don't give your art away yeah. and not just financially but meaningfully as well like don't give somebody your secret sauce if they're not buying it um and if that means they're not spending their time to understand how it works if they're not spending their coins to purchase it if they want it if they're not spending their energy to understand why it's meaningful don't give it to them yeah. um you know so i because what you what you put out is your gift but what people receive is purchased <laughs> is a product <laughs> So, so yeah, um, that's how I kind of started. And as I grew up, like I realized whenever it comes to people consuming things, what they're getting from your work is different from why you made it or what mm -hmm. you're putting out. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of artists don't quite get that nuance. Yeah. Um, it's as simple as listening to music. Like if I make a song, I can make it from a place of hurt or heartbreak or whatever. If you listen to it, it's going to connect to you because something else that yeah. I have no idea about, Yeah, you know? So it's a product, but you're not buying it for the reason I made it. Yeah. So when I was growing up, like that was what it was. Whenever I was drawing things, I'm drawing it for you. I don't care what it is mm. for me because you're buying it. Um, whenever I started making paintings and like bigger pieces of art, I found that if I put a price tag on it because I thought it was a great piece of artwork, sometimes or a lot of times it didn't sell. So oh, wow. whenever I made artwork that I thought people would like, mm. that's whenever I started getting invoices and receipts. Wait, what? how old were you when you started selling art or attempting to to sell like original creations? Oh, um, I was in like middle high school. So like early teens, maybe. Like a young hustler. You have to be like, I wanted a la carte items at lunch. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Matt, 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 Matt. Talk about how, so you, you touched on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. You would begin to write some, you would begin to create something people would connect to. Talk about how now, as you've gotten this far into the space of, I wanna create something not for, the money isn't the end goal. The mm -hmm. end goal is I want an ex I want connection, I want experience, but that is a, a consequence of this thing of trying to build an economy around my art is money has to be one of the effects of it. Talk So talk about, even with money being a side effect, talk about the psychology you went through of you make something, you put it out, there's immediate feedback, you can see the sales, you can see the, tell, tell us about what it's taught you about trying to hack the psychology of the audience you have, of the viewer you have, the listener you have, the consumer you have. Tell us a little bit about what you've understood about psychology and what went on in your head as you're sitting here, like, because it's like, it's like, it's almost like tennis, right? Like mm -hmm. you hit the ball and you, there's a direct 
reaction to how, how you put it out there in the world. They, they'll, 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 if you, if you listen, like you, like I know you do, the world will send back to you a response to your skill level of how you hit it, the direction you hit it, the velocity with it, the power, all that shit. And then it comes back to you. And now you're having the, it's, that's kind of the gar- a game this, that artist merchants play. Talk about a little about the psychology of trying to, trying to understand, trying to get into the psychology and the mind of, of the consumer and the audience and the listener and the viewer. Yeah, um, I think the best example of that would be with the music that I make. Um, growing up, before I get right there, growing up, um, I wasn't super popular. I was popular, whatever, by the time I graduated high school. But growing up, I was the oddball, right? So I was different. So a lot of people are afraid of different because they don't get it. Um, so what that put me in the space of was I felt like in order to get along with people and make friends, I had to assimilate in a kind of way to what they were doing um, and tap into what that mainstream was in the audience or the community I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a part of. So I was training myself without even realizing it into being more intuitive and, and tapping into that psychology that you're talking about. Um, so whenever I started making my own art for profit, um, potentially, I was thinking along those same lines. It's really about just listening and then drafting and testing. And they say that all the time in like science or something, I don't know, (laughs) but it's really true. So whenever I started making music, I just made stuff that I liked because I liked it. Mm -hmm. And you get whatever response you get. It's like how you are with your poetry. You know, I'm making this for me just to put it out there. If you relate with it, great. If you don't, fuck you. Um, That's how I started. And I realized that you get some people that bite, you get some people that don't, but you listen to the audience that you want to tap in with and what Mm -hmm. they're listening to. Yeah. My demographic is listening to a whole lot of trap, rap, pop, the Mm -hmm. beats great, the lyrics suck, all that kind of music. I'm not not about to change the whole sound of what I'm doing to fit that, but I can take elements of what is popular and incorporate that with what I'm doing already and make a hybrid that is more palatable to the audience that I'm trying to tap into. Yes. And that's, I think, where that psychology comes in. So in building the, the project that I put out last year, I have some things that are in there that I like because I like it and it fits with me and it resonates with me. But I have other bops in there or whatever that are upbeat that you can dance to that a DJ can play in the club that DJs are playing in clubs that sound more like a playlist of what's already going to be played that night. Yeah. You know, and then people are like, oh, this sounds like what I was just listening to, but it's a little different. Shazam. Oh, ad. You know what I'm saying? So, but I wouldn't have known that that's, that that would have worked if I didn't take notes of what was already popular, what was already selling and hybridize that with what I was passionate about creating, you know? And then you think like, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, so go ahead. ahead. I have a question after you finish your thought. Yeah, it was was just a really quick thing. The other thing um, about testing was that whenever you are creating new things, you make drafts, I like to test it out. So I'll like, be like, hey, Lauren, it's my sister. Lauren, come and listen to this real quick. Play a couple seconds. And she's like, okay. And I'm like, hmm, hmm, hmm. Now what I want it. Change it up. <laughs> I'm like, hey, Kevin, listen to this draft. Send. He'd be like, hmm. If I see them little dots go like this, I'm like, hmm, hmm. Something's not going to connect. Let me switch it up before he responds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You know, but that's another way of doing it. You test it out and then you just see like what hits, what sticks, what doesn't. It's like focus groups. And Mm -hmm. then you put out what works. Awesome. Mm. Awesome. My question is two tiered in the first tier being in what ways do you find that method of creating fulfilling? So a method where you try and balance out like ways that you like, like you said, you're not totally going to change your sound, but very much having an ear to what will probably hit and what will be popular and what can generate income. Um, so like, how is that mode fulfilling versus like the mode you were doing before where it was all about just like what you want to make. And then the second tier is like, depending on your answer, like how easy or difficult is it for you to calibrate, to find that sweet spot of what's like personally fulfilling and enable, enabling you to like forward motion basically. Yeah. Um, um, commercial sense. For me, I think 
both sides can be fulfilling, um, but with every affordance, there is also like a sacrifice on the other end. Um, it's never a hundred zero. So I think on the hand of um, leaning more into um, how the streets are talking, um, you hey. <laughs> <laughs> leaning, more, leaning more into that mainstream or, or whatever that broader demographic is, is already listening to, it's fulfilling because it always feels great to put out a product that people are interested in, right? In anything um, and seeing a positive reception. I guess the other side of it is if it's not 100% something that I'm feeling at mm -hmm. that moment, then it's kind of like part of it feels a little arbitrary or part of it feels a little obligatory yeah. um, in that create, creative process. Um, and I mean, I, I'm feeling that a little bit right now, but I can get to that later. But the, on the other side, creating things that are just for me, things that I just make because I like it, it works sometimes, it doesn't work other times. Um, but when it works, it does feel great. I think that that fulfillment is equal in strength, but different in how it affects me. Um, when I make a piece of music that I, I just love, I'm just like, yes, this is something that I feel like I can get lost with. And I don't really care about the reception from a mm. mass audience because I didn't make that song for them. Um, the other side of it, though, is if it gets down to like the money game or the publicity thing, being a, an artist that people start looking forward to products and music from, if you make things for yourself and you know it's probably not going to ride with the majority of the listeners that you have, then it kind of suffers with the overall artist image. Um, but then I guess it comes to a question of like, does your audience need to shift <laughs> or? Well, tier one B before you get to tier two, yeah. do you ever at this point in life make stuff that you never release because it just fulfills you? Mm -hmm. And that way you don't have to worry about that piece of it of like, once you've established a certain presence as an artist, you know, like, or do you not because of either time or just you don't see it as worth it you know um yeah there are a couple things that are in the in the archives I guess you could say are in the vault um I actually <laughs> um I'm sorry I have this this draft um somebody asked me to write a 16 and and like rap it I'm not a rapper but I wrote the 16 in this fire. Like if I do Bottom say list, myself, this is your special moment. Matt has agreed to share with us his 16. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Spit that 16. Let's go. I don't, I don't think I ever agreed to that. Actually. <laughs> well, it's um, right here in your contract. So I'm just, I'm just letting you know it exists. Um, Matt's is not going to go up. Matt's, anyway. Matt's rate's going to go up. We got charged like 300 each nah, for that 16. It's not even, it's not even on SoundCloud. That's how yeah, not we, we got, we got the walkthrough rate. If we want to have a performance, we got to send a few extra. Get out. out. 60 a walkthrough and hundred thousand a show. No, <laughs> to answer the question, there are that. some things. <laughs> welcome. There are some things that I do create, but don't release um, either it's less so because I don't think it's going to be successful and more so just because I don't feel like I want to release it yet. Um, and I mean, the reasons sometimes vary, but, but yeah. What about so, in, like, that's specifically music you create mm -hmm. and don't release. What about like within like drawing? Is there a lot of, is there a lot of other facets like shit that you create, like within drawing, within other elements that you don't, you don't ever release for like Leslie's question to go back to that just for the sake of like personal, personal reprieve, like, yeah, there are, there's a lot of art that I sketch out or that I draw on paper that I never take pictures of or mm -hmm. I never put on the internet. And it's not because I don't want to, but I just never get around to doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also just kind of don't know like where to put it because when you get into like your social media presence and everything like that, and I mean, y'all talked about social media and everything before, but when you get into this present, you start building you this last little, week, actually, tune into our last week's episode. You know, I'll be trying to plug and stuff too. Don't be... <laughs> I'm a I'm a listener. Um, oh. <laughs> so he yeah. literally is one of our number one fans. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> Boom! I'm a real one. So I'm. So whenever whenever I think about like building our brand or whatever, you can't just put everything out there like you used to be able to because now the algorithms and things like that like so the joy of it is taken out of posting it online sometimes. So I just don't. Um, but if I ever find a day 
and I just think about it to like, I'm gonna post some drawings and I'm just gonna mm. flood everywhere <laughs> because why not? Um, and then with dance too, sometimes I make choreography or combos that just aren't it. So you're not gonna see it because it's just not, you remember that quality thing you said? It's It comes with curation quality and that just did not make the cut. Um, other times it is things that are good, but I'm not gonna post it because I'm embarrassed. Like I learned the up challenge but I won't go and post it so people can put it over that little audio thing that Sean made where he told you how to do it right and, and point my flaws out. You're not about to do that to me when I'm just trying to shake a leg. So are there any, wait, did he answer the second tier of Leslie's question? He didn't, but Vincent, go ahead and then okay. you can, I'll remember it. I'm holding it in mind. Uh, well, just uh, kind of adding on that thread. I was thinking for music, but even outside of music, are there any places of inspiration that really provoke you to create but also feel very much divorced from what would be like resonant with like a mass audience yeah that's actually kind of where most of my music comes from as far as the subject matter um mm -hmm. if you if you hear most of the catalog that i have um it it talks about or details situations that are kind of offbeat from the normal what you hear about. So instead of it being like your everyday love song or a hey girl, I'm trying to hit you up in the club or you know what I'm saying? Instead of those usual themes, it'll be like, yes, this is a relationship. It's a love song, but something about this relationship went left. Yeah. <laughs> or this is a song about unrequited love or it's about um, misconstrued feelings or emotions. So I like to tap into topics that are offbeat, but I mask that sometimes with other elements of those mm -hmm. songs to be more palatable, depending on what people are trying to listen for. Um, Love that. So yeah, it's a, it's a game of Tetris. I feel like that's such an underrated skill, to be honest. There's like the skill of mass appeal in itself, which I mean, you could say is vapid, but it's a skill, it's a muscle that you have to exercise. But there's something so special about building a bridge to me to like something that like really artistically inspires you but using like the tools of mass appeal but like doing that really well like oh I think that's that's beautiful it's an underrated piece of like pop beauty like I yeah. think like pop music at its best taps into like certain subcultural reservoirs and like feeds it into like the pop form or structure where like you get a different headspace or a different feel. Uh, this is specific to music, but I think it can probably apply to all different mediums. But I think that's such a unique and very specific and very hard skill to do well without either landing on like sanitized to oh. appealing and mass resonant, like the nondescript love song that can be applied to anything or, you know, just forfeiting its mainstream like radio appeal. Yeah. I also feel like there's an element of like self-awareness that makes that hard skill work like what Vincent is saying mm. when it's done well like you can feel it because something I've been thinking about is also like it's multiple layers like it's not just like oh you're doing it well and I like we understand that you like needed to make it a little bit more mass appealing and interpreting that as like and therefore less like artistically valuable or mm conceptually um, strong. It's like, it's just a separate type of concept that is tapping into more of like a mass ethos and saying like, it's human to want mass appeal. And like, yes, um, there has been, there needs to be like push and energy and space created for people who have no interest and no desire for that. Cause that also really resonates with a lot of people, you know, but it's like the opposite end of the spectrum isn't, um, isn't opposite in amount of like uh, capacity for human resonance. It's just tapping into a different area of it, which um, I think is circling back. And most people probably kind of agree with, even if they've never put the words on it, I think with where we are culturally, you know, like how we relate mm -hmm. to music. And I, again, feel like, especially during the pandemic, like there's even more of both that need for tapping into more of like what's everybody and the end more grace I feel like for acknowledging like this is just a very human need and it's not like silly or vapid in any way and artists who choose to try and more uh consciously like make their work palatable are tapping into something fundamental to you know humans like they're not selling out or whatever so yeah I feel like in my mind, it's the difference of as an artist, you're trying to like electrify the zeitgeist, like the big zeitgeist. But 
from a pure profit perspective, you can also just pander to it for the sake of fame or success. I feel like that's like the different mm. approach. Uh, that, that's like the, the one that has artistic depth and the one that's just a machine. It's, it's as simple to me as like, when you have an artist that, for example, is from the islands and they make island music and then they cross over to the States and they make pop or whatever music with an island flair because that's who they authentically are um, versus an American artist or somebody with less connection or whatever who just uses island beats to tap into that market or get that sound you know we love sean kingston on this podcast yikes <laughs> but i mean that's kind of that's kind of what it is like there's there's a way to marry elements that that you really do appreciate or want to uh, give voice to versus just pulling things from from places because you know it's gonna drop and you know it's gonna hit hmm. matt why did you yeah. start doing live performances when? No, why? Why? Because I like being on the stage. Um, <laughs> I just, I just feel so alive on the stage. No, for real. I um, I started doing live performances because. Wait, wait, wait! First live performance you can remember from music? Were you nervous? For, was I nervous? Of course. Like, do you had, still get? Do you still get nervous? Yeah, of course. You know, you get like the nervous poops. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> why, why? Why are they? Why? Why is is life is so? It's fun for you, but is it? Is it like? Is it just? Oh, it's fun, or is it important for a reason? Or like what? Like what? In in terms of being an artist merchant with your music, what role does live performance play for you? Oh, it's huge because you have to think like for someone like me who's just starting out in a lot of respects, nobody knows who I am, and the people that know me don't buy the music. Not as shade, but like. Legit, like people who know you don't typically buy your stuff because they don't have to. They have access to the source. <laughs> um, mm. So it's it's a naturally lower inclination. So the people who would buy it don't know who you are. So you got to go to them. And that's where live performances are very helpful. I went to, I started out going to like showcases and open mics, mm. um, just doing my original music in a room full of rappers. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Talk about it. Talk about it. <laughs> like because I just found the open mic and I was like, okay, cool. The person who runs this like is on the radio station, the local radio station. Cool. I could do that. So I went and then I go in there and everybody that's there are mostly rappers. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we're going to try it. And then you do your stuff. Sometimes people listen, sometimes people don't, but it's out there. And then you keep coming back and you keep performing and you keep going and, and putting yourself out there. And eventually it sticks and people recognize you and people like know that one song that you always do, but it's a good one. So they don't mind hearing it. And then you build followers and networking and stuff like that. So I think it's just a very fundamental way of artists getting their name out is by performing live. And if people rock with your performance quality, then they're going to go back and listen to the song that you made and then keep playing that. And then they're gonna look forward to you performing it because it was so much better than the studio version. Yeah. And the reason the reason I asked that is because like, I think in the age of you, everyone can see, can get on YouTube. Everyone can get on Instagram. Everyone can get on TikTok except China. Everyone can get, actually China's, I think good. China I think blocked other shit like Google. Anyway, um, everyone can get on, yeah, yeah, yeah. motherfucking fucking censor media and shit motherfuckers i ain't disney so i ain't gonna keep my mouth shut about China. anyway um the government not the people other people government um and north korea um so and syria can't get on instagram advertisement to syria syria what's going on Assad fix that shit anyway um the reason i asked that is because i was mad i was sitting here running ads i got i got i got poetry in arabic i'm trying to run ads and i know it's the one arabic country that doesn't show up is syria like, hey, Assad, I know you like fucking gassing all your people to death. I'll say, hey, can you stop doing war crimes first and then we'll get them some, yeah. some um, social media? Then, work, then like, work on the Wi-Fi. As an, as an artist, people might have a tendency to be vulnerable and private and like discreet and have a level of like, um, um, like, 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 it's, it's hard to share your stuff, let alone with the person in your household next to you, your friend, then on social media. But then to get in front of like, a, a crowd and be like, I'm gonna share my shit with strangers who don't know. 
like the reason I, I I'm I'm so intrigued by your your drive and your hustle is because there can be this delusion where people don't see that that's how an artist, at, at, at least for sure, a performing artist builds a fan base and a career. They do it by going doing live performances. You can't, even in the age of the internet, you can't get around that element. I don't care if your fucking SoundCloud song has a million views overnight. Guess what? If eventually you don't get your ass out there as a performing artist in front of people, you're fucked. You are fucked. Like, so the reason, and, and that's a lot of rappers, a lot of singers, a lot of performing artists. And for good reason, we're in, a lot of us are introverts. We're shy, we're insecure, we're sensitive, we're, we're vulnerable. It's fucking, the world, is, the world is scary and it's harsh out there to put yourself in, even if it's a room of 10 people and perform. And even if they don't criticize, you can feel, we're in, artists are intuitive creatures. We can feel the energy. We can, like you said, the little three little dots when I'm texting back about the track, you said, we can feel like, oh shit. Or like your sister goes, ah, like you can, you can, we're so sensitive and we're so receptive as, as, as human, as creatures that when we put ourselves out there, even if no one like shits on our stuff, it can still be a harsh and very brutal and raw and like a difficult experience for us. So for you to constantly re-expose yourself to new audiences, new eyes, new opinions, new environments, and the, like it takes a level of resilience and a level of durability and a level of like, you have to be built different. And so the reason why this artist merchant thing is so different is like, for example, like uh, me and Leslie's story is unique because our parents like, Korean parents who came here and like, we're gonna try to figure this shit out with, with English not being their first language. And a lot of Korean parents or Russian immigrants or like Hispanic immigrants or Middle Eastern immigrants, they come here and they usually like start their own, they, they, they figure out a way to like basically be their own boss. They're gonna open their own shop. They're gonna, so that was natural for a lot of our parents or for a lot of our immigrant generations above us. And then they had a lot of children who are artistic, like, I'm an artist, you're a Leslie's. An, and that merchant side for us isn't fucking natural. Like, I'm not sitting here going, I'm going to move to Syria and open up a fucking like bodega. Like, no, like that shit would, or you, it would be the most, but our parents did it. So there's this, but it's in our DNA, it's in our blood, it's in our fucking like our fabric, that merchant DNA is in us. We have it if we want to activate it, but we're not conditioned. Like, it's hard for us as the creative side to try to, to marry those two. So the reason I asked you about live element is cause like it shows that you're like tapping into, like you said, entrepreneurship is a world within itself that you could spend 10, 15, 20 years and never make it. But kind of like acting, you can go to LA and try to be an actor, spend 10, 15 years trying to act and never make it. And then with art, same thing. You could spend 10, 15, 20 years trying to make it as an artist and never fucking make it. But then to try to marry these two colossal titans into one and try to make and try to try to master or at least succeed in both is so and so I think you I think you get it primarily because as an artist who I know has to deal with all of the mental health issues the plights just of being an artist alone the struggles the difficulties the sensitivities the vulnerabilities of an, of an artist let alone the fact that you're a young black male in the society we live in then that's that's magnified on top of the artist element. You continue to put yourself out. It's like it's like putting yourself in the ring and just getting beat up. It's like um, you just you just have to get beat up for twenty years, and it's like, man, when do I ever get to fucking like catch a break? So I com I commend you because I personally know having to sit in coffee shops and do open mics, having to put my shit on Instagram, and I'm like cussing people out. My DMs are saying like wild like wild shit that they shouldn't be saying to me and i'm literally cussing them out hopefully it's so i know it's i commend uh, you because i'm looking at you going man he's fucking this this kid gets it not kid but you're a young adult you're like an adult but this kid he fucking gets it because a lot of artists are too scared it's like jumping in cold water it's like facing your fears it's like facing your demons or your monsters they're too scared they're too whatever and they just won't fucking do it even though they know that's what they should be doing and so i think that's what's special and unique about you is that you have this talent and this caliber within art but you're also fucking res i got every time i every almost it was like a, for a moment there almost every week on facebook another live performance another live performance another live performance radio show this this um college this whatever the fuck like you always were and i was like he's got he if he doesn't stop, he's going to win. He's going to win. You can't stop someone like that. You can't thwart someone like that. You can't 
you can't put a hurdle in front of someone like that who's like, motherfucker, I'll create the art and I'll, and you can knock me down. You can fucking throw this shit in my face as many times. So I just, I yeah, I just, I just wanted to ask you about that because you're very unique in that sense that like you're resilient and you can take the punches and take the blows, but you're also very, very artistically inclined. So I know those blows aren't easy for you to take and that criticism isn't easy for you to take and those experiences aren't easy for you to go through mentally, emotionally, et cetera. Yeah, and sorry, I like jumped in in the middle of your sentence earlier. I don't know. I was going to say though, like it's, it's the, it's the mentality of if you have something that you believe in and you know, can mean something to other people, you are doing yourself and everybody that you could possibly help a disservice by not pushing it through and not getting it out there by any means necessary. You know what I'm saying? Um, Because for me, even though the music that I make is obviously meaningful and valuable to me, I know that the messages that I speak about and the way that I deliver the those messages can mean something to other people that are listening. And it's not music that I feel like you hear every day. And it's not uh, themes and concepts that you hear from male artists or male singers currently. And I know that I'm filling a gap in yeah. the industry. A white space. Or in, in that atmosphere. Um, so I would, I feel like I'd be doing myself a disservice by not hustling and not trying to get myself on different stages. And the worst, the worst that can happen is I go on stage, give it all I have and people don't follow me or that's don't listen fact. to the music again. That's a fact. And for me, that's not a- But that's Matt, 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 Matt. You, you, again, that points to your resilience. Rejection is fucking terrifying and devil, like, you, you're, you're special and you, I'm, tr- I'm trying to like highlight a point. Rejection is, whether it's from a romantic interest, whether it's from a parent, whether it's from a job, whether it's from a college, whether it's from a crowd and audience, you don't know what, whether it's from a, st- rejection is fucking hard. Like it's, and some people, like some people, the reason they're fucking like not well adjusted is because the first time or the first couple of times during their childhood when they got rejected, they never fully dealt with it, processed it healthily, like, dealt with the emotions and learn to move past and move forward in life. Like, so I, 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 like, I, that, again, that points, like there's going to be a lot of people who hear you say the worst that can happen is they don't follow me. And then like, there's people who hear that and they go, do you realize that's like me going to the beaches in, in, in Alaska and asking me to jump in the water and like negative 40, like exposing my, you're na- like, as an artist, you're naked in that room. As a human mm-hmm. being, you're, you're singing, like you said, you don't sing, I always made this joke with Matt whenever he would send me songs that were like about unrequited love. And I would go, what's her name? And he would never tell yes. me. He still doesn't tell me. But the reason I asked that is Matt's songs, Matt's lyrics are so poetic and so specific. You can't like, you can't just sing them and think like, oh, like you can hear if you, especially if you print the lyrics out and read them, you can see a, like, oh, there's a specific scenario he's drawing from. This isn't about girl, your eyes are pretty and your hair is long and like you're kind. No, he's like, pointing out very so I look at him and I always go like Matt's making like figuratively speaking Matt's making him his soul bare and naked in front of the audience that's hard to do I'm gonna go up here and like show you my like no clothes like my soul is gonna be born naked before you and like you get the chance to like ah fam you know like you know how many people are in life fucked up because of that and they can't like uh, they're not well adjusted in life and don't know how to receive love or forgiveness or don't know how to love themselves because one person their parent their sibling a, a ex fucked them up in that way of the not so i just want to like point out how special and unique that is about you that you have that that mental tenacity and resilience to have that mentality to go the worst they can do is not follow me because as an artist, as an artist merchant, if you're just an artist, you can like hole up in your little alcove and like talk to no one and just keep creating art. And which that's very, in a lot of ways, it's very beautiful. But for someone who wants to be the artist merchant, if you don't have that mentality you have, you're going to fail. Unless you're rich or mommy or daddy have money or you know a fucking Jewish lawyer or like so for some reason they like Scooter Braun went and found you on fucking YouTube, you are going to fail. Unless you have Matt's mentality of worst they can do is not follow me. I wake up, I'm still alive tomorrow. We're right back at like, like, yeah. So I, I just, I, 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 it's, we kind of breezed over that point. You kind of just said it. And I think some people can just go, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the play, the actionable item of make any one of us today, 
go into a room tonight and share our art. Vince, you go share choreo. Leslie, you share like an illustration or a drawing or a writing or something. Matt, you share a song. I share a poem. Go do that tonight in a room full of people, like just a random ragtag group. You're going to walk away from the experience like emotionally exhausted, drained, mentally exhausted, drained. And it's, it's, it's not something you just want to keep re-exposing yourself to. Um, so again, I just, I just really want to give roses and flowers because like the things that I understand as someone who, who, I, who I'm, I, I'm aspiring to be an artist merchant, as I pay attention to other people, I go, he has his fucking head on straight. And if he, as long as he doesn't stop, he's going to win. And it's because of shit like that, that everyone can like, Whoever hears this podcast and people on Instagram, they'll retweet. Like, if you put what you just said into a fucking Twitter, like, info, like a graphic, worst thing they can do is not follow you. Twitter verse, Instagram verse, likes, retweets, 100, 100, flex emojis, all this horse so. shit. And it's like, motherfucker, you. You you like that statement as an ideal, but you don't fucking live like that. You wouldn't fucking expose yourself like that in front of an audience of people. That shit is not like easy. That's not fucking easy pickings and a fucking like toast on, on a Sunday. It's not easy shit to do. It's soul draining, soul exposing, soul devastating shit that can fuck someone up for the rest of their life. So I just don't want to let that moment pass without highlighting to anyone listening and to you and to let you know you are you are very special and very different and built. You're built as a different cloth and as a different breed. That's that's Leslie's dad. That's my mom. That, that kind of tenacity, the worst I can do is say no. Someone else is out there. Someone else might like it. That's a merchant tenacity. And that's not native to artists. Like that has to be learned. That has to be instilled. It has to be bred. It has to be fucking like like so thickly divulged into your fabric and fiber and DNA that if, if, you, if you don't have someone constantly pushing that into you, if you don't have the merchant DNA, you will fucking die if you try to do this artist merchant shit. So again, I'm kind of gassing you and shit and we got to end here soon. But I just want to let motherfuckers know that that's not easy light shit. We retweet, we say yes, we agree, we heart emoji, we flex emoji, we 100 emoji. That's, that shit kills people. And and ninety percent of ninety ninety nine percent of the people who go flex emoji one hundred one hundred thousand facts 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 ninety percent of people who do that aren't doing the actionable groundwork item that Matt does, and so I don't I don't ta- I don't put any gravity into it when I see people on Instagram say that when Matt says it I know I see the fucking Facebook performances over and over and over and over and I go he's about he he talks that shit and he walks that shit 99% of you aren't fucking walking that shit so don't give me the whole flex 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 100 100 100 I agree like 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 retweet retweet the fuck up unless I see you out there doing this shit don't give me no shit about 100 because you would never you would never in a million years bear your soul naked on a stage in front of strangers and night in and night out to go years of trying to fucking make this thing happen and maybe never not get nowhere and just hope and pray that by some, like the planets aligning that shit would work out for you. So I, again, I just, man, like you're very fucking special in that way. Kind of a, adding on to that, but then maybe flipping it to the inverse framing. I'd love to hear, actually an answer from all of you, but Matt as well, because I, I, when it comes to like performance art too, right? Like I remember performing, I used to get really bad anxiety before performances. Um, to the, and it was, got worse towards the end of me dancing to the point where I was like, is this worth dancing? But one thing that always propelled me forward is that anxiety is about like the risk of rejection, but there's also something so powerful. Um, I would just call it powerful action. Like there's moments when you perform where you feel powerful and those moments where I felt most powerful on stage make those anxieties worth it. So I'm curious for you, Matt, young Sitch, or in anything, maybe it is like dance, uh, but also for the rest of you, because we've all performed in different capacities. What's been like a moment in your, your, your journey where you just felt like super fucking powerful, like so powerful? Um, actually, I think for me, it is more, I, I have more vivid memories uh, whenever I was on fusion dancing. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk about this mm-hmm. pretty much every time first of all i think i peaked in 2016 it's <laughs> like first of all talk about it but okay <laughs> no no, no I, I i'm i'm rebuking that for you <laughs> no, 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 no. um but no i i think about my time on fusion and a lot of it is attributed to the people that were on the team um through my tenure and just how how everybody's drive was just like 
through the roof. I feel like everybody was trying to level up and we leveled each other up in, the, in that process. And I grew so much from that as an artist all around, not just as a dancer. But I remember Prelude uh, 2017 was the year that Fusion won first place. And ever since like I got into college, that's all that anybody ever talked about. Elliot, Bernique, all of them, they're just like, oh my gosh, we never placed in Prelude. Like it's the biggest thing of the year. And then we would just knock like third place one Wait, year. Wait, also for our non-dancer listeners, can you explain what Prelude oh, is? My bad. So Prelude is a um, com- competition that's held regionally uh, across the country. And it is, um, they have like legit industry judges coming down to watch like 15 or 16 teams from that area compete and you put together your set and you dance and it has to be very technically sound and all you get scored and they win and if you win your region you go to the next level which is like national and stuff like that so it was a huge thing and every team in north carolina looked forward to it every year and every year that i was on the team we started I came on the team before we had won anything in Prelude. Then my freshman year, we got third place. Next year, we got second place. And then after that year, the OGs that were on the team when I was there had graduated. So I was on the e-board and it was a huge, it was a lot of pressure. Fast forward, we won first place in Prelude. And doing that set, there was a moment where I kind of, it sounds cliche, but it is true. I was, I was literally like sweating going, like going on the stage that never happened before. I was so nervous and anxious. I was sweating before the music started, which means I was a hot ass mess by the time it was over. But there was a point in the middle of the set where I'm like drained, exhausted, putting so much energy out. But I looked around and I just saw everybody else on the stage putting out that same level of energy, like everybody like I'm getting emotional just talking about it again mm-hmm. and by the end of it some of us are visibly crying like at the yeah. end of every set we yell like fusion and everybody yells back fusion so I yelled that and and burst into tears and just hearing that reception was like nothing ever you go backstage afterwards Elliot and Kayla are waiting Susan's waiting and they're like hugging us and congratulating us and Oh, it was, it's nothing like it. And that feeling of accomplishment, like you couldn't tell me shit while I was on that stage because everybody was putting out 110%. And that's what, like Vince was saying, makes it worth it for me. Um, and, and as an artist, as an artist merchant, especially, that's when you know, like, I don't have to think profit first with what I'm creating because we're all exerting our best and you can't deny quality. Mm-hmm. You can refuse to spend your money on it, sure, but Fact. you can't deny quality. Fact. So I, I agree. Like that's that was probably the the most powerful moment I've ever felt on a stage. Mm. Leslie. That's what I'm going to say next time anyone rejects me in anything. You can't deny quality. You can refuse to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Period. Know. Honestly, like, I don't think I've ever performed at the level you guys have, like, in different arenas. I mean, I did Prelude with Blank Canvas. I was not very good, honestly. Like, I just I feel like I'm not as good in that area. But one time, well, actually, I just would rather hear, like, Vincent and Kevin. Mine's, like, I have felt powerful in sharing my art, but not in the context of, like, because it was a huge audience and I felt, you know what I mean? Like this electrifying, it was more like often intimate spaces and not just friends, but like smaller spaces and where it was a little more like less of a performance and more of like an interaction. So I don't think it's quite the same. What about for both of you guys though, Kevin and Vincent? Cause I feel like you guys have been more in those types of spaces Matt is talking about. Vince, was the question about performance or just art in general when I when we felt powerful? Art in general, I, I for me it's through performance, just because that's how I that's my only conception of it. But if you have any other examples, um, I can imagine. Well, so to answer my question and say why I can imagine it applying to other things, uh, mine is also dance related. It's actually also prelude related, 2015, and there's this moment where. It was my OG Bobby Johnson piece. And there's this moment at the beginning where I walked from the back to the front. Seriously, if I think about too hard, I also get emotional because in that moment, like you could not tell me like a goddamn (laughs) thing. Like not, I've never felt so powerful in my life. Like 
I felt like I had pulled up on the entire auditorium and there's like the ga, 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 and we did it and the auditorium like erupted and I <laughs> I feel like I fucking did voodoo in that bitch. Like that shit was <laughs> uh, Yo uh, I remember, but what is it? I remember. Oh my gosh. What is it exactly though? Like that is so like what do you mean? What does that mean that someone couldn't tell you shit? Like what kind of power? Like is it just the simple like it's beautiful to have people following the energy that you are putting so much work into like creating? Like what I think it it's it is something like that. Uh where and why I can I can extend this to people that sing and also uh like rappers because there's like this visceral feeling that you can feel but you can't see where like you have everyone in that room like in your hands mm. and like so engaged and like mm. feeding off the energy and mm. I can only imagine what it's like to be like a musician um any kind of musician and be like like a fucking like stadium and have like mm. a stadium people that all know your song lyrics like I'm thinking like hip hop and they're like fucking rapping back at you like viscerally or like singing their hearts out. Like I can only imagine from the perspective of, of a musician, how powerful that feels because in that moment of a few hundreds of people, like that, that's, that's like a, something that really would be hard for me to forget just how I felt in that moment. I'm probably going to cry the first time that happens to me. I'm not going to lie. I'm a Hopefully we'll all be in the audience that the yeah. first time that happens. <laughs> Like if I start a chorus and everybody else finishes it, I'm going to break down. Oh, it's, you'll just be like, "That's it, show's over. You can go home." Like I need to go process. Like, it, it's a, it's literally like a culmination of all the work that came up to that moment, and the lights are on, the music is going, and you just gotta go. Like the adrenaline plus that energy, mm-hmm. and it just fires something up. It really does feel like a whole nother presence, like. Is just there and you're just going and you're putting it out it is i don't know i can't it's, explain it it's kind of like an ego death experience i feel like i turn everything into psychedelics but honestly it feels like where you lose a sense of self and you just absorb into the greater energy and it like it's like a, a mm. freaking harmony with the the audience or consumer and that's i don't know really... if... oh go ahead no go ahead, I was, go ahead i was just gonna say real quick that's a really beautiful framing that totally makes sense but i feel like is not often the first thing people would think of, you know like if anything they would be like wow it's such an ego rush you know like you're the one person mm-hmm. and you're holding like thousands of people in the pub but like i can really mm-hmm. see yeah like i wonder hmm. it's it's mm-hmm. totally wild for me it, it feels like oh well, speaking to that like my body goes on autopilot in a way mm-hmm. and i think what i mean by that is just like my, my i stop overthinking everything and mm-hmm. and i just do and that's whenever I think talent comes in. That's whenever your gifts come out. Whenever you stop trying to constrain them or push them or control them with your mind, just let it happen. Because because in those moments, I think back now, like that set, yeah, I was dancing and I was doing whatever job I was doing. But at that time, like the energy was everyone. And it was everyone's collective presence that made that moment feel so powerful to me Mm. to where like you realize not only am I doing something that means something to me, but people are seeing it. It's meaning something to them. And everybody on stage is counting on you to amplify them. Like everybody is, it's a synergy that's happening that builds that, that space to where whenever you do the final note, you feel it like, Mm. The energy is just moving. And I, I don't know. This shit is amazing. It's like drugs or something. Uh, literally. Wait, Kevin, did you have an example? Yeah, uh, just to comment on that real quick. I think it's like, Les- like Leslie, you know how sometimes uh, it's, uh, on this podcast, sometimes in real life, you have like, if you get into like a real good flow of conversation with somebody who just gets it and like y'all are in this flow and it's like, so it's, it's like that dance performance is a conversation amplified by several hundred people. So to feel the energy of several hundred people mm. who are getting it and you're the communicate, mm-hmm. it's a dialogue happening both ways in the flow state. It's like, you know, crowds amplify energy. So it's like, you're not just receiving the good energy of one person in a really good conversation that's going really well. You're receiving the energy of like several, cause you, as a dancer, you're hitting, you're, you're, 
the dance is your part of the contribution to the conversation. And you can sense an eye contact, body language, sound effects, reactions, eyes, like the reaction to your dances, the, they're part of the conversation. So it's, but it's so fast and so rapid that you're getting all this information input so quick. And so it's like uploading, upload, like into like this, like super saiyan type shit. Like you just upload and then it's like, all, like it, it's like overwhelming and shit. Um, for me, I think, uh, there's two times, either performance or writing. So like the last time I felt that powerful was because of love. And it was because that let like Leslie asked me to do that one poem at Jojo house that one night. And it was cause like, mm. I don't know, I don't know how to explain it. I don't know how to. Okay. Well, just it. to set the scene, it was Christmas break and we were at our mutual friend Jojo's house and he had this big Christmas tree and presents under the tree. And it was just a small group of friends who were back in our hometown together. And yeah, Including Kevin had. That. I was there. And, and, and I think all of us were there. Yeah, all of us were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was us. So and, beautiful. Yeah. But anyway, Kevin had a long love poem that he was preparing at that time to do what was going to be a public performance. Um, and I had just asked if he would like do it for us. So that's to set the scene. And so, yeah. And so we, we, we were supposed to do it at like this bar we were at. I didn't do it. I didn't share it there. And we get back to the place. And I was like, yo, you got it. I was like, oh, shit, she remembers. So I'm like, all right. So I get up there um, and I just do it. And like, th that's that like... <sighs> I don't know how to explain why it felt powerful, but all I know is that like, I knew that in that room, it felt like I, again, with the conversation of dialogue, as I'm performing, like I'm stopped, like at a certain moment, I literally stopped and said, and that part was just the introduction. And then I go into, there was this constant engagement between like back and forth between me and y'all. And like, it, I, I can feel an engagement from y'all an investment from y'all. And, but I'm also up there just like pouring my fucking heart out like at the height of when I had this poem maxim like um, memorized. And it was like, when I got done with it, like it, 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 I don't, I think there's something to the element of when you're in a room of people who you know are paying attention and are engaged and are like being affected maybe by what you're saying and do like, and they're actually like, there's like love emanating from them. Cause they're actually like in that moment, they're giving you attention and love and focus and like actually like almost leaning in, you can feel that. And then you're trying to like share the, in a moment of you exposing yourself, making yourself naked and vulnerable, and someone's reaction isn't like to like act like they're not impressed or like scoff or like to criticize or like look down upon or be like, oh, that was like in Despicable Me when Gru's mom, he's making a fucking rocket ship and she goes, nah, like no one's doing that. It's like this moment of I'm going to make myself naked for a moment. And then people go like, oh, like that's like, that's really like beautiful and delicate. Like, thank you for that moment is like to be, you know, to be, to be, to be seen. To be seen and embraced and accepted, like that level of like the, the power of love and overwhelmed and like broken and like that, because you're you're free, you're liberated. That's power, freedom, liberation. Like you're flying, you're in the wind, and like you don't have to force or push, and no one's having to like oppress or 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 critic. It's like that was power for me because it was like the power of community, the power of like people making you feel uh, liberated. That was that was that was power. For me. I will oh. say, whenever you were telling that poem, you got through the intro. I feel like there was a collective, damn. <laughs> An unspoken, yeah. <laughs> and then when you said, and that's just the intro, we were all like, oh, yeah. Shit. <laughs> so we yeah. definitely weren't ready. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we had just been like having a really casual, chilling evening and we we're all sitting on the couches and then Kevin stands up in front of the glowing Christmas tree after a year of COVID and then shares dramatic. this like 15 minute love poem. It was a beautiful moment. A soliloquy, if you will. <laughs> and then yeah, he like begrudgingly stood up. Like and took then, a deep I breath know, in. Pretending and then like I just leaned into like this. I wasn't ready this for this, symphony. but... <laughs> And then Vince spent eight weeks telling me I wasn't in love. Anyway, so, um, oh all right. Well, Matt, thank you for joining us. Like, man, like, again. Wait, I'm, I'm... wait, before we before we close out, we can cut this if we want to. But Matt, do you want to, we should share what you shared in the chat if you want to. So, um, I'm sorry. As, I, as we were recording this, um, I got a message from my manager. Ew, hold on. Hey, uh, no, <laughs> Sitch got a message from his motherfucking manager. Hey, it's up I and hate it's stuck. how that sounds. It's like, up and it's stuck. I not not in the sense I don't appreciate everything, but like it just sounds so like am I you know anyway. So I got a message and um 
basically like I was just informed that my song um, Runway is going to be played on the radio as part of a countdown. So, you know, like those top 10 countdowns and it's like, um, is it lit or throw it away? Like fire or trash kind of thing. So people got to vote and call in to get it on the list for the next week. Yeah, It's going to be on like one of those kinds of countdowns on the radio soon. And so I, I I freaked out like this is literally this the first th- all the first people that I'm sharing this with so <laughs> this is amazing oh, you heard it here first <laughs> congrats yeah. that's incredible is there any way we can know like like what stations are gonna be on when's it gonna be is there any way I could be able to tune in on the internet or yeah I'll um, call them gladly I'm about to say my error code still nine one zero was good uh, okay Ooh, me too. <laughs> Okay. Same. Actually, same. So what's up? None of us better live right. in North Carolina, but still have a North Carolina. <laughs> so it's going to be on um, ninety-seven point one, uh, and I'm local to the Raleigh area of, of North Carolina, so I don't know how those frequencies work. But okay. if you follow um, Coco Filipina on Instagram, um, that's C O C O F I L I P I N A. Okay, I need to get paid because this is a plug. Um, but no, if you follow her, she is the person who's going to be doing that countdown. So I don't know if she's going to go live as well whenever it happens, but she just made a post about it too. So, yo, for us, like when she makes the post and it's happening in real time, like give us a heads up on your IG stories and shit like that. So, and get plug the number, plug the all, plug all that shit so we know, like we can see a heads up and call in and all that shit. Okay. Yeah. She, she made a, she just made a post of like, comment below and say who had the hottest song this week oh shit okay easy i'm number three easy money yeah hopefully we can get our little uh ig live crew on our bottomless account to all come through oh hell yeah yeah for sure trying to get my crew to come out too i mean shoot (laughs) yeah but (laughs) but no this is it's it's wild because i i never would have thought that um the music that I make would go anywhere beyond my personal channels. And if somebody that I already knew shared it. So this is a pretty big thing for me. I'm processing right now. So if I seem underwhelmed, it's because I don't know how to process emotions in real time. <laughs> no, for sure. For sure. Well, this is a very, I feel like it's special that we got to record your yeah. <laughs> initial reaction. A thousand, one thousand percent. Wow. Well, Matt, thank you. And I think it's, it's, it's so special because we all know you. We love you. We do do deeply care about you. I've said this a, a couple of times before, but I just want to keep putting it into your head. Um, you're thought about, you're cared about, you're loved, you're, you're held very near and dear and precious in the hearts of, of people who want to see you do great things in life. Uh, so thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for like coming here and bearing your soul and like sharing dreams and being vulnerable with us. Uh, and we hope to like, and, and so, not we hope, sometime in the future we'll have you back on and we'll just keep kicking it about life and shit like that and keep talking about art and dreams and life and love and just what the fuck is going on but thank you for thank you affording us your time uh and and spending this time with us to like share with us about about shit that we were like digging and like excavating into your life about thank you likewise i really appreciate it and and to you guys too like i really just appreciate the fact that you guys are um building this platform to have these kinds of conversations not only with people or whatever but just about topics that that nobody seems to want to dive into for sake of whatever reasons you know um you guys have talked about the gamut of everything from your social media persona to um life and its taboos and religion or the lack thereof and um all all of these topics that we deal with as humans on an everyday basis but a lot of times don't have the words to articulate um, we talk about heavy, heavy things, even like death and love and heartbreak. And I, I think the best part about you guys' show for me is that nobody shies away from how they feel as problematic or ill-informed or one-sided it may seem. That wasn't shade, but legit. Like, we all, we all go there. You're talking to me. It's okay. <laughs> you? Uh, she's talking to me. You all, talking to me. Talking to me. <laughs> first of all. If y'all have not listened to B-R-O-W-N-M-O-U-F-W-A-S-H, <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> we're on the same boat. <laughs> and there's a hole in that boat for each of us. But like, I, I, I love that it is authentically honest conversation. And you all are cautious of and aware of correctness and sensitivity 
but are still unapologetic about how you perceive these topics and these issues. So as much as as much as you all may appreciate me for being here and sharing myself with you, I am equally grateful for you guys opening this kind of platform for me to be a part of it as well. So thank you, Matt. Thank you. Uh, you're so, thank you. Love you very much. Love right. you guys too. All right, when y'all, when y'all, when y'all close this out, when y'all close this out, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. I haven't known this in a while, so if I mess up, please don't laugh at me. Thank you for listening to the Bottomless Podcast. Uh, yeah, you can find us on listen. Instagram, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, YouTube, Spotify, Spotify music. Apple Music. You can find us wherever you want to find us. E T T M L E S S Podcast. Bottomless. Bottomless.